My name is Lisa Topel. So I'm the worldwide public sector technical business lead um, for IoT, um, specifically focused more on smart cities. And that's what we're going to dive into today. Just to, there we go, advance. So really high level overview, uh, agenda wise, you know, I'm not going to go much into IoT. I, I would love that some of the prior uh, attendees also have touched on this. That's perfect. Um, but how is it being used? What are the drivers around it? What are the key use cases? And then specifically, how are these getting implemented today? Um, in, in, and I'll go through some specific examples of that. So this is how I start off. We start off all our discussions um, around IoT. And that is if you knew the state of everything or every device, every piece of machinery, and you could gather data from it and add intelligence to that data, what problems would you solve? And I've had some experts refer to this as the data dividend that each connected device or sensor can provide. And that dividend doesn't happen unless you can analyze the data in a way that aligns to your objective. Um, I like to say that customers don't buy IoT, which is true. Now, some argue with me that they buy IoT enabled devices, which is correct. Um, you can buy a connected light bulb or a door lock. Um, but what you hear is a different problem statements from customers on their need to track assets or their challenge around optimizing the fleet of vehicle routes or you know, managing the health of their machinery. And uh, so just to reiterate, IoT is a really business solution driven technology and our services and solutions and partner ecosystem is critical kind of to get to that next level. The, the next slide I'm going to show is a video, and sometimes uh, my audio is questionable with it, but uh, I'll set it up and let you know that I wanted to give you a sense for who my largest customer is, and that is Amazon itself, just to give you a sense of how much IoT, robotics, and AI are being utilized um, and, and, and championed within the company. If you can see that okay. So this is just one of the Amazon fulfillment centers. We have 175 of them. 50 of them are specifically robotic-centric uh, and driven. We have hundreds of thousands of robot drivers. Um, and in addition to that, um, you know, I'm interested in things that Amazon uses this uh, semi-trailers and has a camera with uh, machine learning on it to better detect um, and tell the drivers how to load uh, trailers. Because keep in mind that the average trailer on the road today is at 50% capacity. And even our Amazon Go stores are a great example of, you know, cameras that are capturing object and people recognition um, in a completely cashierless transaction. So we work really closely with Amazon as our largest customer, um, and they help us make uh, and and uh, not only bring solutions to market, but begin help us reiterate and uh, drive better improvement. So how companies are way, reaching? Oh. Let, me, let me interject. Sure. It's amazing how big those warehouses are. <laughs> it, it is just mind boggling. Yeah, we do. We do offer for customers fulfillment center tours to some of our, and if you ever have a chance, it is, uh, it is, it is, it is mind boggling. Just as you said, it's pretty interesting. So how companies are reaching their customers and how they're building new products or driving efficiencies. These are some of the primary driving functions of people interested in IoT. And we see the pressure to innovate with IoT that kind of really follows one of two paths, um, either operational efficiency, and this could be uh, somebody optimizing their manufacturing facility or setting up uh, better asset tracking or implementing predictive maintenance on key machinery. Um, and the other path is new revenue growth. A new revenue growth really could stem from a new product uh, that it's created or a new service. Um, and in an example of a smart city, a new service could be you know, like a tolling system for a roadway, for example. So our IoT services empower customers with the intelligence needed to build new services, new business models, improve products, um, and then enjoy better relationships with their customers and constituents over time. And, and why is that? It was basically because they can understand their needs and, their, and the business operations um, much more efficiently. 
So my, uh, this is how we've structured our IoT services um, to help you manage complexity um, when you build an IoT solution. That's usually one of the biggest pushbacks, uh, I think, at any company I've ever worked at selling uh, IoT solutions is it needs to, we need to have it more digestible and easier to implement. And you keep in mind that um, what's estimated to be, I think, 75 billion connected solutions by 2025, which is about eight times more than the population of the planet. Um, and it's not just the growth in connected things um, that's generating a lot of attention. It's, it's, it's the huge opportunity that's created with all of the data that is being generated and that data that gets collected. And then again, how do we act on it and how do we prove um, our industries as a whole? There was a study that said um, if, if there was a 1% reduction in capital expenditures from IoT related efficiencies just for the oil and gas industry, it would save $90 billion over 15 years. So AWS has done a lot of the heavy lifting to simplify, um, and we've kind of split this into a three-tier logical view. So I'll start at the bottom. And that's really, how can I connect my devices and operate at the edge? So the device software, which really is the edge and provisioning layer, and this is where you onboard, you know, operate, and you manage your devices or assets. And then next, you use like, how can I control and manage these? So the control services, which is think of it as the communications layer, this, this handles the, the connectivity, the message routing among the devices, between the devices and the cloud. And then the top layer is really how to extract value. And the data services um, provides kind of the ingestion and the analytics layer, um, which aggregates all the disparate data streams um, and then helps you analyze, visualize and perform ML. So I, I double clicked into this just a little bit. We'll go over this. Um, we have a pretty comprehensive portfolio of software um, to secure and connect your devices at the edge. And it looks like a flywheel because it is, because the more we add intelligence at the edge and then connect to the cloud, then secure, manage, control the device. And then that data you need to structure the noisy data and extract value. And, uh, and then you can leverage the AI technology to add more intelligence. And so then the cycle continues. So a couple of things to highlight is at this device service level, we have a solution called uh, FreeRTOS. And I, I think this is just interesting in a sense that there are a lot of free uh, real-time operating systems out there. And it, they're basically open source, real-time. Um, they're targeted towards microcontrollers. And why that's interesting is that there's going to be, there's about 40 times more microcontroller-based technologies out there than CPU-based technologies. So we're going to see an explosion in the number of connected devices um, more and more, things that historically maybe weren't connected. Another um, device software level solution we have is Greengrass. And basically, think of it as a, um, it's, it's a, a software that runs on the edge that basically brings a lot of our Lambda compute uh, and local messaging and storage and our device shadows to the, to the edge. Um, and you'll see this used in gateways. Um, and it helps you when you're in a situations or scenarios where devices may be offline um, and need to sync and reconnect it. Our control services are really kind of their, our historical front door of our IoT solution. And our IoT core is that, um, you know, that serverless connectivity and messaging service. Um, we also have our device management solution, which is just exactly what it sounds like. It helps you manage you know, and query and be able to store your, your manage these, these millions of um, sensors and devices. And then um, Device Defender is, um, is an, a service, an additional service if you wanted to add additional auditing and anomaly detection. And then lastly is uh, the, the analytics service. So this is um, really important, especially with IoT data, um, because IoT data can be very noisy. And by that, I mean data can come in, let's say you have data coming in from uh, temperature sensors, and that data could come in uh, both at Fahrenheit or Celsius, for example. So there's a lot of uh, cleaning that sometimes is needed um, to, to get the data in a, in a, in a state um, that then can be more consumed. So that's just a little background on, on some of what our analytics uh, platform does in addition to driving, um, you know, a, 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 additional um, analytics features. SiteWays is a new solution um, that's in our analytics category, and it's targeted um, just for industrial facilities. So 
uh, historically, there has been a challenge getting some of the manufacturing facilities to get the data out to be able to do something with all the siloed data. So this is going to really drive a lot of improvement and efficiencies in that space. And then IoT services are integrated with more than 130 AWS services. And so many of these can be applied to smart city projects. Um, and they really act as the foundation for other emerging technologies. As I mentioned, AIML or robotics, AR, VR, computer vision, or even data lakes. And many of these projects require large amounts of data in order to increase accuracy or build and train ML models. Um, or in the case of a data lake, you need to collect a large amount of data from various sources. So all of these can help um, as you build out your IoT solution. And because of our depth and breadth, AWS was named a leader in a worldwide applications platform for smart cities by IDC. And this report really assessed the market landscape on IoT applications um, enabling smart cities. And lastly, um, for this kind of context, um, our IoT partner network. So keep in mind, when it comes to IoT, no matter what system you're using or solution, uh, pay attention to the, the, the partner ecosystem. Um, IoT, more than almost any other solution, is um, heavily reliant on having some more standards right now. And um, you know, having a strong partner ecosystem is going to help as we try to drive you know, alignment with the silicon vendors, our OEMs, our ODMs, our contract manufacturers, the gateways, the carriers, um, the independent software vendors, and then you know different types of systems integrators. So there's a lot of uh, coordination that can uh, is needed, I guess, to bring kind of the solution and bring it to to production. And one of the biggest trends I, we see and hear all the time is smart, um, smart farms, smart factories, smart equipment, smart processes. But what does that really mean? And what does it get you? Uh, what we mean by smart is having systems that are fully integrated. They're collaborative systems that respond in real time to meet changing demands and conditions and also meet customer needs. Essentially, this allows you to control your data uh, to enable your business and its employees to make better data-driven decisions. Oh, and also I was going to comment, um, when we look at digital transformation uh, for smart cities, some of the key drivers that we're seeing and, and requested um, is one platform across many districts, a need to respond and act on the data, and the requirement to ensure cities uh, are, are more intelligent and enable uh, future innovation. And cities are also asking for the need to attract people to their city by pro providing better services. So what is a Nirvana smart city? I'm from Seattle, so I use the word Nirvana. Um, but we're working with a city or a county or a university um, around any type of a smart space for that matter. Uh, we develop a roadmap based on four types of automation stages. So firstly, you know, you've got your data sensing and metering, which is really the most basic type of smart city use case. And it enables simple tasks such as asset management, um, predictive maintenance, um, possibly using cameras to monitor social distancing or tracking body temperature on people when accessing uh, a building or an event. Second, there's the real-time and historical data integration and monitoring. So imagine uh, uh, adjusting the heat and cooling temperatures accordingly based on seasonal temperatures. Third, there's the combining data model, which is the analytics and mach machine learner to enable devices for example, within a building or a city to be able to act on the, the collected data and self-improve over time through local trained models. An example, when to change uh, filters in a school based on the number of students attending, the present air quality, and the type of the filter. And then finally, but critically, visualization uh, of the solution through a single pane of glass. So uh, that's an expression we use a lot, but the single pane of glass or that one uh, aggregation of that data to consume uh, for different audiences. You might have a different uh, uh, version for a building management, uh, community or city officials or tenants, for example. And how do we break down smart cities? Well, we map it into kind of four uh, key areas. So smart transportation, um, transportation systems designed for smart cities. They have cutting edge technologies, 
platforms, um, real-time information, traffic flow, passengers and commuters. Um, we have smart utilities. These are organizations in the utility sector are focusing on using, um, optimizing cash flow without losing sight of their long-term goals. They're moving toward updating the current grid, for example, uh, integrating it with networking and computational and to connect and automate uh, energy distribution. Smart building, we're seeing um, both on the commercial and the public sector um, quite a bit. Uh, there's a lot of uh, ROI and cost savings to be uh, had with better managing your um, your smart building, uh, whether it's your HVAC, your lighting, your appliances, um, but also including your emergency response. Um, then finally, the smart citizen services, and this is really a broad um, category, catch-all category in some ways. Um, and this comprises anything from smart education, healthcare, intelligent security, or threat management. It even includes things that the citizens are interested in, such as like waste management, for example. So I'm gonna dive into now some, um, where we have some customers and partners that are driving these IoT use cases today. And I wanted to quickly point on Noveta, and it's a advanced analytics company and they're doing a lot of digital transformation projects with governments. Um, they are currently deploying the Picard sensor fusion platform to several Air Force bases. So they're you know, one of the driving forces around kind of the smart Air Force or a smart base um, concept. So the Picard core uh, captures sensor data um, and then translates it with our technology into usable formats. So it can, uh, sensors range from dry contact sensors, complex multispectral sensors, and we're, you know, we're expecting about 50 to 100,000 smart Air Force, uh, smart sensors per Air Force base. Um, they're also doing a lot of processing of video um, as sensor data, and then they're able to apply the machine learning um, to make it more relevant. Smart airports. So airports across the United States are literally their own cities, and they have their own governing bodies uh, own budgets, future capital investment services, um, and a lot of times their own law enforcement. And the average airport in the United States is over 40 years old. And so they're going through a lot of um, capital improvement programs to modernize. Um, more than 50 US airports could collectively account for 70 billion of construction by the end of 2021 to give you an idea of <laughs> the amount of focus there are on updating uh, airports. Parking at the airport um, has room for improvement and it, it is an easy way for increased RNI, ROI. Take advantage of um, like the Seattle Tacoma Airport, for example, is my local airport. And it only has 11,000 um, parking spots, but it drives an annual revenue of you know, $80 million a year. So we're partnering with Verizon um, sort of for these smart airport solutions um, on the airport land side, um, driving curbside management, parking revenue optimization, and then parking management. Um, and then there's additional projects that we're looking to explore and, and uh, that could help or, and innovate around airfield and airspace security, um, like foreign object debris, drone detection, air, airport, airspace management. But the ultimate goal is to improve passenger experiment, uh, experiences and reduce their environmental impact. SimCon has a great solution. Um, they have a lighting solution. And if you think about over half of the world population is living in cities. So this puts a lot of pressure on cities and resources are, and are forced to look at being smarter. Um, so a lot of cities, uh, this is kind of the baseline, they're looking at smart street lights. Um, it's one of the easiest ways to implement um, valuable technology um, and, and see that return on that investment sooner. Um, SimCon has a way to control, manage, and maintain LED streetlights, uh, so it immediately reduces the maintenance and expense um, and energy costs. The average uh, decrease in cities' energy bill is about 30%. Uh, one thing I'll point out too is one of the things I like about SimCon is their, their solution they have implemented for university campuses and smarter campus offerings. Um, so they have a solution where if somebody does not feel faculty or students don't feel safe on campus, there's an app on their phone, which replaces the kiosk, that you can trigger, and then the light uh, it goes to a given geofence and it starts flashing. And then this also notifies the campus security as well. 
And SimCon has a hybrid lighting uh, network. So it's either LoRaWAN, Narrowband, or any of the other city networks. The New York subway is a project I've worked on for a couple of years. Um, and it's a pretty simple project, but it has a huge impact um, from a revenue and a, um, you know, the, the citizenship and the writers. Um, they have a, the largest mass transit system and the manager at 1 trillion in assets and have over 2 billion riders per year. And these assets are anything from trains and buses, but also include all the tracks um, and the, and the, and the, tr and the uh, signals in the tracks and the bridges and tunnels. And so we worked with the MTA to make um, the subway cars to ac accurately predict when the subway would be arriving at each stop. And the MTA then pushed that data to a public facing website for citizens to use and get access to. Myo Vision um, is, is a solution that manages and monitors traffic signals um, remotely to prioritize resources and then solve issues before they es escalate. A lot of cities have zero vision goals, um, and this is a goal to eliminate all traffic fatalities and severe injuries while increasing safety, healthy, and mobility for, our, for all. Um, City of Maricopa in Arizona, they've installed, I think, 75% of their intersections are using this uh, traffic link technology from MyoVision. Um, let me hit the next one. I'll, I'll kind of finish up with transportation in a second. Um, Edulog is another great solution that just is, is starting to, to launch. Um, and if you think about the school, you know, US school bus uh, technology, um, there's over 700,000 US school buses and they're 20 years old. And many of the technology on the buses today are not connected, meaning they, they don't connect the data until they get back to the bus barn um, to, to plug in. So Edulog created a solution that captures data um, coming from the buses, but also insight as to the ridership or optimizing bus routing. Um, the increased uh, real-time capture of the telematics, so they're having less breakdowns Due, or, due to higher predictive maintenance on the older um, bus technology. But it's also uh, providing improved safety because parents are now able to receive notifications when the bus is about to arrive or drop off a child. Waste management is probably the number one um, uh, ask on the citizen services on recycling and, and garbage. So, um, you know, we're working with a company called Rubicon, Rubicon and they're a leader in sustainable cloud-based waste and recycling solutions. So their platform has a smartphone app, uh, a plug-in device, and then a web-based portal. And it allows cities to be able to track metrics, including um, service con uh, confirmations, or if there was a missed pickup or an issue at the curb, um, the vehicle usage and ma maintenance information, and which is more efficient operations and, and greater sustainability. Um, and they improve the city, um, the, the kind of service for cities and customers. And then all of this information is fed back to a secure website for supervisors and dispatchers to evaluate and assess issues in real time. So there's an explosion of camera technology um, to stream real time information. So we're seeing this in smart spaces to notify, um, like for a public park area, for example if additional resources are needed in a given location. Um, smart cameras are being used in manufacturing uh, to look to see if there's any anomalies or problems during a manufacturing process. Um, but also, while somewhat controversial, there's a growth in body-worn um, cameras as well. And this is a great solution from body-worn um, that uh, is worn by police officers and first responders that increases situational awareness. Um, it can provide backup to the officer as needed, um, but they're also using a lot of the um, data to work out um, patterns and also to see, uh, to help better train um, responders um, in the future. The city of Virginia Beach um, had a, uh, did a great thing and they pulled together, they had already quite a bit of sensors and technology, um, and, they, and they brought a group of people together to ingest the data streams. Um, and the storm sense was the outcome of it, which is an IoT enabled 
forecasting research initiative um, to enhance flood preparedness in Virginia. So kind of flooding resulting from either like storm surge, rain or tides. And it uses flood modeling uh, to address different multiple um, flood types to determine risk in of, uh, certain areas or bridge mounted ultrasonic and microwave uh, radar water level sensors alongside um, crowdsourced data collection. So this is another great solution that we're seeing implemented at this point. In Kansas City, this is my last use case. Um, Kansas City uh, has done a great job. They have a two mile corridor um, of their streetcar uh, where they have 328 Wi-Fi access points, 178 smart street lights um, that can detect patterns and open parking spaces. They have 25 video kiosks. Um, and then it's all connected to the city's uh, fiber optic data network. And their chief innovation officer said the other day that they, they like to call it the smartest 54 blocks in the nation. So with these devices generating, generating data day and night, um, plus they had 4,200 existing data sets, the city um, has a solution to turn data into tangible outcomes. And they used a, uh, worked with a company called Exact which provided uh, an urban analytics and intelligent platform that helps policymakers um, just better work with cities on how to better function. So this is the end of my presentation on smart cities.